On today's episode of the Free Pilot Training Channel, I'm going to show you how to make the perfect landing. Aircraft calling, same position. Let's get started today by getting up into the pattern. We're going to discuss takeoffs and the pattern in a future lesson. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on that. Making good landings is one of the biggest struggles of many private pilots, so today we're going to focus on that. A lot of people think that making the perfect landing starts right here. But this just isn't the case. In reality, making the perfect landing starts in the pattern. So if you want a beautiful landing, the first step is to have a stabilized approach. This simply means that our airplane's in a safe position and on speed before crossing the threshold. Doing this will allow you to focus on the round out and flare, which can be the most challenging part. So how exactly do we get a stabilized approach? We always make our patterns exactly the same. All right, turning left downwind here. There's our altitude. Good rule of thumb is to fly inside the wide arc. Uh, that way, in case we need to lower our flaps, we can do that. Benita traffic, Skyhawk 3148 X-ray, left downwind 17, Benita. Getting a little low here, getting a little power. So I'm just flying 80 knots here. All right, let's run the checklist. Seat belts on, fuel selector valve on both. Flaps are up, mixture full, rich, throttle set, car beat off for now, landing and taxi lights on. And we'll finish the rest of the checklist once we're beam the numbers here. So if we want to have a stabilized approach, the first step in doing that is to do as much of the before landing checklist as you can before you start the descent. This will allow us to focus on our altitude, airspeed, and center line all the way down to the runway. Then, when we're abeam our intended landing point, we'll finish the checklist, except for flaps, and begin the descent. I call this the perch point, and if you're stable right here, it's a lot easier to be stable throughout the rest of the approach. Here we are abeam the numbers, we'll finish the checklist. Throttle set, 1700, first notch of flaps, carb heat on. Now I'm just going to pitch for 70 knots, just pitching for 70. Once you're at the perch point, there's a lot of different ways you can fly this approach. On these first two legs, I typically recommend pitching for your landing speed plus 10 knots. Then, once you roll out on final, you can pitch for your final landing speed. This is one of the most important times to keep an eye on your airspeed. There have been a lot of pilots who have stalled turning base to final. Then, if the plane is uncoordinated and enters a spin, it can be almost impossible to recover. Now I'm going to enter the age-old debate. How do we control the speed of our airplane during this approach? On most smaller training airplanes, you'll find that you control the airspeed with pitch. For example, if your airplane's getting slow, pitch the nose down. If the airplane's getting fast, pitch up. This might seem unnatural at first, so if it does, think about how a slide works. You can go faster going down than you can up. Now, I will say that some airplanes require power changes to control the airspeed, and some require pitch and power changes to control the airspeed. But this is probably not the case for your training aircraft. That being said, if you find yourself on short final and you're getting slow, don't pitch the airplane into the ground. Just use a little bit of both. All right, we talked about controlling our airspeed. Now let's talk about controlling our altitude or glide slope. We can do this two ways, with flaps and with power. Now typically, unless I'm trying to land without them, I'll start the perch with some flaps. Then when I turn base, I'll lower some more flaps. Then turning final, I'll go ahead and lower the rest of them. Then if I feel like I'm not descending fast enough, I can add more flaps sooner to increase the descent angle. The other way we can control our glide slope is with power. I recommend starting with a known power setting at the perch point. For my airplane, that's about 1700 RPM. Then as you might have guessed, less power gives us a steeper descent and more power gives us a shallower descent. Let's continue this approach. And now we're in a descent. About 45 degrees off the wing. We'll make a left turn to base and slowly start lowering some more flaps. Benita traffic, Skyhawk 314, X-ray, left base, 17, Benita. Pitching for 70, second notch of flaps. Ideally, you want to turn base when the runway is at a 45 degree angle behind you. But if you're just getting started or you're struggling with landing, drive it out for one more potato before you turn base. This is going to give you a nice long final which will help you get stabilized. This is going to help you make that perfect landing. Somewhere in here, we got blown over last time. We'll turn early, lower the rest of the flaps. On final, we'll pitch for 60 knots. Benita traffic, Skyhawk 3148 X-ray, turning final 17, Benita. Now that I've rolled out on final, I'm thinking about three things. Aim point, 
airspeed, and centerline. Now we've already talked about how we want to pitch for our airspeed, but now we're pitching for our landing speed. Just remember, once you start getting close to the ground, use pitch and power to correct your airspeed. Now let's talk about centerline. What do I do if my airplane's not aligned with the runway? First of all, how can we tell if we're not on centerline? Well, we have to look at the whole runway. One of the first things you'll notice is that the side of the runway that's away from you is more slanted. If I'm on center line, those two sides are more symmetrical. Also, if I'm right of center line, the center line will seem to slant away from me. Then you'll see the center line slant the other direction if I'm left of center line. Okay, let's say I'm right of center line. How do I fix that? Well, as your instructor may have already told you, the answer is bank, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. When I think of a centerline correction, I think of it as a three-part maneuver. First, we need to bank the airplane to get it back over to centerline. But if you stop there with your control inputs, you'll end up on the other side of centerline. And if you keep correcting the same way, ultimately you're going to be S'ing down final. All you have to do to fix this is to roll out right as you're capturing centerline. Then once we've done that, all you have to do is align the nose with the runway using the rudders. A quick memory aid I use to get myself on center line is to roll in, roll out, align the nose. And I use the same control inputs out here to correct center line as I do right next to the runway. Then, if you've been paying attention and you're not too far off, you only need smaller, quicker control inputs to fix the problem. Now, if you find yourself way off of center line, close to the runway, you can always go around if you need to. And while you should go around if you're unstable, be aware that you can use big corrections to fix center line. Just be aware that big control inputs lead to more big control inputs. This is called pilot-induced oscillation. So if you ever need to make a big control input, do it, then immediately take half of it back out. This will help eliminate pilot-induced oscillations. Now let's talk about one of the most important, but also most neglected parts of landings, the aim point. How can I say I made a good landing if I can't control where I land on the runway? Well, I don't think you can. That's why I'm going to show you how to do this. Most pilots agree that a 3 degree glide slope makes it easiest to transition to landing during the landing phase. So now you're probably thinking, well yeah, let me just break out my protractor. No, we've got some other tools we can use for that. First we've got the VASI, or the Visual Approach Slope Indicator. Now most of these are on a 3 degree glide slope, but some can be as high as 4.5 degrees, so make sure you keep that in mind. Also, when you use these, they're going to direct you to aim for an area right next to them. Then you should land roughly 200 feet beyond that, so if you have a short runway, this is something to consider. I typically only use VASIs at night, but that's just my personal preference. PAPIs, or precision approach indicators, are a lot better. You'll typically find these at big airports with precision approaches. These direct you to point right beside them, and typically this is aligned with the front edge of the 1,000 foot markers. But today I'm going to show you how to capture a glide slope without using these lights. To do this, First, I'm going to pick an aim point somewhere on the runway. For me, unless terrain or trees are a factor, I typically pick the threshold. Now, this isn't where we're going to land. This is just where we're aiming. We should land about 200 feet beyond that. So I'm expecting to touch down somewhere right in here. Now we need to establish a reference point inside the aircraft. This depends on the type of airplane you're flying and the flap setting. But for most training aircraft with full flaps, a good reference point is about a fist length above the dash. But if you're landing without flaps, you'll have to shift your reference point a little bit. It should be somewhere around the top of the dash. Now that we've aligned the aim point with the reference point, we're going to be using pitch and power the rest of the way. And that's because both of these two are related. Here's how this works. If I'm on a perfect 3 degree glide slope headed towards my aim point with the perfect power setting, my speed won't change. But if I'm high on glide slope and I'm keeping the same aim point, I'll get too fast. If I'm too low on glide slope with the same aim point, I'll get too slow. Now, if you're getting too slow, you want to pitch down to gain that airspeed. But if you pitch too low, you'll go into the ground. But then if you pitch up, you'll get even slower. And that's not good either. And that's why there's so much confusion on which controls you should be using. That's why anytime you're flying a glide slope, you have to use both pitch and power. Let me show you an example of how I use this. I'll start with a known power setting. In most training aircraft, this is anywhere from 1500 to 1700 RPM. Then I'll pick my aim point and start heading down to the runway. If I'm too high, I'm going to start getting too fast. So to fix this, I'm going to reduce the power to recapture the glide slope. Then I'm going to pitch to maintain my airspeed. You may have to disregard your aim point just for a second until you recapture your airspeed. Then, as you're approaching the proper glide slope, recapture your aim point and your power setting. 
If you don't, you could find yourself below the glide slope. And I think you're going to find that a stable glide slope or flight path is key when making an excellent landing. Pitching for 60 knots. Got a slight left to right crosswind. Just put a little bit of aileron into the wind and a little bit of top rudder. We're sli flying slightly slanted. And that's, that's what we want to do for the wing low method. Maybe a touch high. Pull just a little bit of power. A little high, we'll go a little bit less power. Getting a little slow, I'm gonna pitch down to gain that. Might take just a little bit of power to offset that. Getting a little slow, we'll pitch down and power. Somewhere in here, landing is assured, we'll go to idle power. As soon as the nose of our airplane crosses our aim point, we'll transition to the landing phase. If you notice, right before we got to this point, I called out landings assured idle power. And that's because if I'm carrying any power when I cross my aim point, I'm going to land beyond my 200 foot landing spot. The same is true if I land too fast. Even with one knot too fast, I'll end up landing long because the airplane will want to float. But just be careful with this, I'll take a long landing over a stall any day. Now here's where this aim point really comes in handy. When the nose of my airplane touches the aim point, I'm about 15 feet above the runway. This is going to allow you to make your landings the same every time. And if you're not using an aim point, you're going to be trying to figure out how high 15 feet is above the ground instead of focusing on landing. Now let's talk about the round out. Don't overcomplicate this. All you have to do is to shift your aim point once your nose crosses your original aim point. Now put your aircraft reference point on your intended landing spot, then fly this down until you're three feet above the runway. Now we need to flare, but I don't want you to think about flaring because that can cause you to balloon the airplane. That just means it climbs back up instead of settling down onto the runway. I also don't want you to do nothing because then you'll hit the nose wheel first. All you have to do here is raise the nose wheel six inches above the rear wheels, then just freeze that pitch attitude and the airplane will settle onto the runway. With the airplane in this attitude, shift your vision to the end of the runway. Then use right or left rudder to align your nose. This will keep you from landing in a crab, which can be a really scary experience. Then from here, you'll have the most beautiful landing you've ever had. All right, let's finish out this landing. We're just gonna drive it down to the runway. Just gonna put it in the landing attitude, and just hold that nose off. There it is, got blown over just a touch. Then just don't forget to maintain center line once you touch down. Before we get out of here today, I want to leave you with one little bonus tip if you're trying to make a straight in approach. When you're flying VFR, always set yourself up on a three mile straight in at pattern altitude, and here's why. If you fly your pattern correctly, you're also flying three miles, except you have a turn every mile. So if you set up for a three mile final, you can fly it exactly like you do in the pattern. At three miles, start your perch. At two miles, start your base. Then at one mile, start your final. And that's how you get stabilized for a perfect landing from a straight in approach. And these techniques can all be used in every kind of landing that we do. Hey, I hope you learned something today. If you did, be sure to smash that like button for me and I'll see you next time on the free pilot training channel.